There's two nice ladies. They're from the Cowles County Child Advocacy. Uh, I just met uh, Danny Whittem, and uh, the other is Burl Anderson. Burl Anderson and I go back to childhood. I'm not going to tell you how many years that is. So at this time, here are the two nicest ladies in town. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm Danny and this is Burl, and we're from Cowlitz County Child Advocates. If you've heard of CASA before, um, anybody know what CASA is? So that we're still, um, it was just a name change, like Apple to Google. Uh, we're still guarding ad items for children in foster care. So what we do is um, we are a volunteer-based nonprofit, and we recruit members of the community to be trained and sworn in as officers of the court to be assigned as a guardian ad litem for children in foster care. In Cowlitz County, um, we're appointed to any child that comes into dependency, which is foster care, from 0 to 18 years old. Every single child in Cowlitz County that's in that dependency system, our program is appointed to. Our staff can't handle, right now we're just over 220 children in the county that we serve. Um, that's on the lower end right now, usually it's around 350, 400. COVID um, really brought numbers of child in care down. That's not because it's not happening, it's because uh, mandated reporters don't have access to children um, through the school system and through the uh, that daily contact with children. So, so um, what we're here today is just to tell what we do and um, that advocacy, what that looks like for the child that you'd be assigned to as a volunteer is um, reporting to the court how they're doing every six months. If they have an academic thing they're struggling with, or a therapeutic thing they're struggling with, or a medical thing, um, we can check in on all those things and let the court know how they're doing. And we prepare you that by having a 30-hour training that goes over the span of five weeks. Um, and we train you on the, rule, the rules and role of you in the court system. And so it's a really it's an incredible um, honor to work with these children and to be a voice to them. Um, we don't we're not we don't work for CPS, we don't work for the attorney's offices, we are completely independent. And so we get to come in there and just cut through everything and say this is what's going on with this child. Our judge in this area, we have the same judge that sees every single case and works with every single child and family. And he's multiple uh, multiple times has said that our reports and what we have to say as a recommendation is one of the first things he reads because he recognizes that that volunteer has that independent, really um, important relationship with that child and all the people that work in that child's life. Um, so we need about 100 volunteers to properly serve the children in this community, and we've only got about 40 right now. And so we've, COVID really impacted our numbers of volunteers. It's really difficult to um, advocate and visit a child over Zoom. And so you can imagine um, that combined with just the chaos of the last two years now almost two years, um, really impacted the amount of people that we have serving our children. So um, that's our, our pitch is to ask if you're thinking or anybody you know um, wants to volunteer in their community. Earl has some uh, pamphlets that we'll hand out that has more information and our, both of our contact information on there. We also just joined with Grocery Outlet here in Longview and they right have here. something called a SHARE program. And um, so we have cards that we can hand out to anybody that's interested. And anytime you go through Grocery Outlet, if you scan that, hi, <laughs> yeah. if you scan that card, um, we get some some profits back to our organization. So um, so if you're interested in having one of those cards and participating that way, also just getting the word out in the community what we are is, is very helpful. Telling your friends, telling your family, if you have organizations like this um, that we can come and speak at. And, let people know um, what we are and what we do. Not people, not very, when I first heard of CASA, I had no idea that that system even existed there for children and that checks and balance was there for children and that it was a volunteer base that we train you, we prepare you, we get you ready um, to, to fill that role. So getting the word out, and of course, we always accept donations as a nonprofit, um, but our, our high need right now is volunteers and getting the word out about our organization. So, does anybody have any questions? I'm working on not talking super fast, so I'm sorry. It talks really fast. <laughs> I talk fast. <laughs> in the department, is that your 
When you say child welfare, is that what you mean? DCYF or DSHS, yeah. Yeah, so um, within that organization, there's multiple um, ways that they help families and children that come into care that become dependents of the state of Washington. Those children specifically are the ones we deal with through the child welfare system, but we absolutely uh, work with the child welfare um, workers. In this case, it would be the social worker that's assigned to the case. And uh, what happens is we go to court and there's the parents' attorneys, the department and their attorneys, and then us. And so the department has, um, you know, a vested interest in the department and the system and their liabilities and their policies and their rules. And the parents' attorneys have a motivation to follow what the parents are asking and to fight for what the parents want. And so there's nobody there that's for the child that gets to fight for what the child needs and what the child wants. And so we get to come to the ta table as a party to the case. So we are just like a parent attorney, just like a um, department mm -hmm. attorney or the social worker. We get to come to the table after um, investigating and working with that child and talking with that child and, and reporting to the court what we found. So, um, but yeah, collaborating with all those individuals as well outside of court happens too. Yeah. What sort of training is involved for the new advocates? Yeah. So we have a uh, quarterly training that we're currently in the middle of our fall training and we'll have another training in January and then in the spring and in the summer. And it's five weeks, Tuesdays and Thursday nights from five to eight. And we train you on the guardian ad litem rules, um, the laws, and, um, and then of course all the child development and all the services that are offered in the area, how to write a court report, um, everything that goes into being an advocate. And then once you graduate, you take an oath with the judge, and you're assigned to a staff, a paid staff, a volunteer supervisor, and they're there to support you through anything and everything. We recognize that it's a volunteer position, and people have lives and jobs and everything, so those volunteers are really to fill the gaps where you need. So if there's a meeting you can't attend, or there's a, a court hearing you can't attend, they jump in and, and, and fill that role immediately for you. So, um, and then every year, you have by state law, we have to do about 12, 12 hours of continued education. And so we offer through us and different community partners of different areas of expertise trainings all year long on different child welfare um, topics. So that's how we, we keep up with that. And our trainings, um, because of COVID, something that came out of COVID, we had to do everything on Zoom. And so you can either attend in person or we have live Zoom. So you can log into the computer at home and and participate via the computer or come in, in person to offer both of those to offer that flexibility. After retiring the second time, after retiring the second time in 2018, I decided I wanted to become a, a CASA at that time volunteer. So I volunteered at Wallace School and then I decided to do the CASA training and it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it because in 1994 when it started, I was at the city of Kelso. And I remember when CASA first came into being and what it was all about, and it was always something that interested me. And then in 2019, they asked me, hey, girl, would you like to come on staff part-time? I said, okay. So now I work with Danny and Outreach, and it's a wonderful program, and they advocate for two small children who, you know, don't have advocates for them. Um, the parents have attorneys, but the children don't. One is one, and one is three. And it's very rewarding, and I've seen them on Zoom, I've seen them on FaceTime, um, it's just a wonderful uh, program and it's very rewarding, but the kids need us. They need people out there to stand up for them. The needs of the kids are very important and they count on us. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. We haven't, I don't believe we have any partners. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah, we have uh, lots of community partners where we refer people to places, but I don't know about immediate relationship there. Yeah? How do you, how do you relate to the CJAC? Oh, so we work with CJAC. Um, uh, so if there's a criminal case going on, um, we don't generally participate too much in it, but it, um, we'll attend meetings and kind of keep, keep be aware of what's going on in, with that case. And then, depending on the outcome of that, what happens with uh, with our with the dependency case? Yeah. 
children? Yeah, they're zero to 18 years old. So any ch minor. Yep. Um, we usually do, uh, we usually, we just did Give More 24, uh, we raised $16,000, which is wonderful. Um, and then we do a, um, not a luncheon, an auction, auction, auction. Um, usually in the springtime. And because of the COVID stuff, we didn't do it this year, and because of some barriers there, we're looking at maybe doing a luncheon or something. But yes, we, we try and, we're trying to do a quarterly event um, or some kind of, So social media is our main platform, and then word of mouth through our volunteers, and then any community partners we talk to, and then we have a board, um, and that board spreads the word out. Um, but it'd be something we would share with you guys if you're interested in hearing that information, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the little, in the little trifles here. In the little trifles here, too, is uh, how it, can you help serve a child if anybody's interested in that or anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just a Um, so the events that we do, uh, uh, spreading word about the events that we're doing, um, sometimes we feel like we did the squirrel fest and tabling events, and if we had anybody that was interested in assisting and tabling those kinds of events, um, hosting something like this is, is super helpful to get the word out. If you guys are involved on social media, liking our and sharing our page, and us liking and sharing your page, um, and having those kinds of relationships um, in that way. And then, of course, if anybody wants to volunteer, we'd be happy to have some new volunteers. And I gave uh, Dandy some applications for our club. All right. <laughs> I know my husband's been wanting to for a while. My husband was a law enforcement officer for 11 years, and he talks about the lions all the time, how great they are. And so I'm, glad you're, I'm almost there. <laughs> well, maybe this is the one. <laughs> how many employees do you guys have? Uh, we have seven employees. Eight seven. employees. Eight. Yes, because we just hired an admin person part-time. <coughs> yeah, not all are full-time. I think three are three or four are full-time, and the rest are part-time. For the volunteers that get assigned to a child, yeah. We do yeah, 30 hours of training quarterly, um, and yeah. Uh, meeting with my executive director and sitting down with my executive director. She's more, uh, I'm with volunteer outreach and volunteer recruitment and retainment and just spreading the word. And if there's a, a partnership in that way with a community partner, it would be with the executive director because she knows the needs of the funding and all that kind of stuff. So I thought I could ask, I have a car and we can arrange that for sure. And I know she'd be happy to, <laughs> to sit down. Okay. <laughs> actually, it's second vice president. That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> this whole staff up here can do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is there one more? Yeah. So we say <clears throat> dependency is is a court procedure through the superior court, and that's a, <clears throat> it's determined that a child whose parents have um, allegedly committed abuse, neglect, or abandonment of that child, and it rises to a level that the court becomes involved, and then that child that becomes a dependent of the state, and so then we become involved. So it's after it's been decided that the child has that there is abuse, neglect, or abandonment, those three things. And then after that, the child is, they have a court, they have a couple court hearings, and the order goes out, a dependency order, and then that child is now a dependent of the state of Washington. Sometimes that means a child gets placed in foster care. Sometimes it means they get placed with a family member. Sometimes they get placed with a suitable other or, um, or an in-home dependency if the parents just need a, a lot of supervision and a safety plan. It depends, of course, on the situation. But what we, when we get involved is when that, is, that order is there, that it is, the child is a dependent of the state of Washington. And that's right now about 220 children in this county. Yeah. If you become a volunteer child advocate, 
And assuming you stay with with the program and stay a volunteer, do you do you stay with that child all yes. the way through until it's that yes. child is eighteen? Thank and you. If it's still in the system. Yes. Yeah. So we ask when you we go through we have an inter application interview process, and during that interview we talk about the timeline. Most children are in care for about eighteen months, but there are some cases where it goes longer than that. And we, so we ask for that commitment to be able to be with that child for that length of time so that the child doesn't have multiple advocates coming into their lives. I, um, children in care experience a lot of changes. I had one child, I was a um, volunteer for a couple of years and then I became a staff member and then I became um, the working in volunteer development. And I had a child that by the time she had been in for three years and had 97 different placements that she had been in. And so, and I, and I think six or seven social workers, and I was her only advocate that she had ever had. And so, being able to be that, and, and you can imagine the barriers that that creates in a young child, behavior issues, and uh, academic, I mean, just lots and lots of things. And so, being able to be that advocate that has the whole picture. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many social workers or attorneys came into the picture, and I had to give them the rundown on this child's history because I was the only person on the case that knew this child and what was going on with this child. And so I was able to be that person for all these other people coming into her life. And so when we talked with volunteers in that interview process, we gave their level of commitment and how long they can do it because we don't want to be adding to that issue of having multiple people coming into a child's life. So you have a direct relationship with that child, yes. not just a paper relationship or a record keeping one. Yep, we ask that you see the child once a month minimally. Um, we're not big brother, big sister, so we don't take the child anywhere, we don't babysit the child, um, or we don't buy them anything. We're there to talk with them about how they're doing, depending on their age, their cognitive capacity, um, and maturity level. We talk to them about how they're doing, any state of desires that they have, and then overall, um, like I said, academic, therapeutic, medical, any needs that they need, or that they have. But yes, you create a relationship with that child. Yeah. Your program is just the county's Yes. And if those, can you give us numbers? Yep, 220 children right now. I think that's low. And that number usually is around between 300 and 40. 220 children in the county right now. We have 40 volunteers and seven staff serving those children. Yeah. So there's a there's great programs for aging out of foster care. Um, there's so I talked about neglect, abandonment, and abuse, neglect, and abandonment. And there's a fourth type of uh, foster or dependency, which is extended foster care. So it's um, a child who turns 18 but doesn't want to be out of foster care yet, wants to remain in the system. And the benefits of that is as long as they're in the system, they have access to a lot of resources. Um, children now that in the state of Washington that, that were in foster care have access to a free college education. Um, they have access to housing and all kinds of things. And so we, which it, it is, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. I have two youths that I was just talking to that are in it together. And um, they were talking about how it helped them get jobs and find a place to live. And, but we can, when we can stay on at that point. We stay with them as their advocate as long as they're in dependency. And one of the things we teach you in the training is all the different services within our community. Our community has so many wonderful services. It really is incredible. And, um, and so we can kind of be that, that reminder and that idea giver and that referral maker of, you know, have you checked out this or can you, have you looked into uh, the independent living skills um, is one organization or one program that helps um, teen youth in the, in the system with anything from cooking to finding housing to a job, filling out an application, putting together a resume. Um, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Can you share a couple of success stories? You ever have an adult come back and say, you really helped my life? Yeah, so, um, so I'm sure the girls got one too. I've got a couple that I love to tell. <laughs> yeah. So um, that, that youth that I had, that I was saying that I had been um, she's been in 96 different homes. She, uh, the, the state wanted to place her out of state in a residential facility, and I, they wanted to do it quickly. This was in this county, by the way. They wanted to do it quickly and didn't let us know what they were doing, so we kind of found out in a roundabout way. 
And in order for me to conduct an investigation, we asked for another week. And so and I was a volunteer at the time. And so I called the facility because I had found online um, allegations of sex abuse from a staff on, on, on children in the, in the program. And the staff had been let go. But when I asked about it, they said, well, the child who was 13, um, that she was a contributor and helped make that happen, that she was complicit. And so I was really concerned about that. <laughs> yeah, I was really concerned about that, obviously. And um, so I went to court. Well, I courtesy called the social workers and said, I really have a bad feeling about this. This is what was reported to me by their head person. Um, I was hoping to get kind of a solution of well, apparently our hiring process needs revamping. We need to be looking at, you know, and there was none of that. It was just excuses and dismissing of it. And I let them know I was going to be objecting and why. And they said they didn't care and that they were still going to ask the judge. And so we went in front of the judge and I explained everything I found and the judge denied it. And she wasn't allowed to go. And because of that, they found another home for her that turned into an adoptive placement for her. And she's going to be adopted. So because I said I need a week, I just want to ask about the Oh, and that facility also was shut down uh, last year for further abuses. But, um, because I just asked for a week to make a phone call to interview somebody, and then went to the judge and said, hey, I have this concern. And the judge said, yep, no, we're not doing that. Um, they forced them to look at other options, and we were able to find a I also have one more. <laughs> so the, the sister to that child, um, she they were different different parents, and she um, was a, a teen youth that was she'd been in the system for about five years and turned into a teenager in the system, and um, she was starting to struggle, starting to go down a bad path, starting to play with drugs and and getting into some bad friend groups, and um, she had just bouncing. I think she was at thirty something homes. Um, and they had no idea what to do with her in a teen youth. It's really difficult to find placement for, let alone an adoptive placement. And I had another uh, another group that I was, a sibling group that I was working with that had just lost their placement because the woman just said she didn't really think she had, had the capacity to work with really young children. And I just knew the personality of that person. And um, so I called the social worker and said, hey, have you thought about this person, this foster home, as maybe an option for this teen that we can't get a home for? And she said, yeah, well, you, you, why don't you introduce them for me? I don't have time. <laughs> and so I uh, went and met with both of them, and they went and got ice cream, and, and she got adopted by her two months ago. And so because of the relationships, and that was, um, we actually, that was a, a pretty big social media, uh, we were in the newspaper for a success story with that one, because um, the, the foster mom said, if it hadn't been with my, my relationship with CASA and my trust of CASA and this CASA that was working on this case, I wouldn't have been open to meeting a teenager and being that placement. But because I had worked with her on this other case and I knew that she you know, she cared and we had had a relationship, I decided to give it a shot and now that, that little girl's her daughter. So that was a, a pretty incredible being able to be that advocate, advocate and that idea. Because that's what we're there, just to be a squeaky wheel and kind of an idea giver <laughs> of solutions and to remind people what the timeline is for these children, that they're just sit languishing and we need to make sure that's not happening and, and use all resources. And when we have a, you think of a social worker, social workers generally have about 30 children that they're responsible for. And the brilliance of having a volunteer-based program and why the Seattle judge that created it created it was there's just something special about somebody volunteering their time for a child that's not getting paid to do it. And um, and that, that specialness of being able to be that, that's, you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart and for your community, and you don't have 30 other children that you're working with, you're just working with that child. Um, and so you can give all that focus and that attention to that child, and that the social worker's not giving them, that an attorney's not giving them, that nobody's giving them, because you don't have 20 other children you're worried about, or at one point I had 80 children. <laughs> if you don't have all those kids, you as a volunteer are trained and ready and empowered to be that advocate, and you've got one child or one sibling group that you get to advocate for, and that attention, that's why that phone call to that facility happened, because I didn't have 20 other kids that I was worried about that I just didn't have time or think to. I was, that was my hour of advocacy that week, was just calling that facility and asking some questions. And that led to you know that concern and, and the denial of the order. So. Yeah, I think Marilyn asked, did parents ever get the children back? Mine have all been little, so I don't know. I think probably. I, um, 
I haven't been around long enough yet to have that happen. <laughs> but there is a book called Three Little Words, um, and, and it's a wonderful book about a girl. And she was 18 when she wrote it. And she, and she has a picture of her casa. It's one of the only pictures in the back of the book. And uh, she talks about how she saw her casa, you know, once a month. But when she got her case file, she saw all the work that her casa had done, and all the pushing that her casa had done, and all the demands that her casa, recommendations that her casa had made. And uh, so when she was an adult, she went and found her casa, and now they travel and talk together about about that, yeah. And we have lots of reunifications of families too. We just had reunification day. Uh, now, gosh, it's been a month and a half, two months. <laughs> but it was in the park over in Calso and or Riverside, sorry, and um, and it was a bunch of families that had reunified over the last year with their children, and the parents came up and talked about their journey and how their lives were changed by the, the groups that came in and the, the or the teams that came in to help, including us, and um, and that was beautiful. It was just beautiful, and that does happen quite a bit. Parents, a lot of times, you find parents were were foster children themselves. Um, and we're in cycles of um, abuse, neglect, abandonment, substance use, mental health, and it's just a cycle, and, and, and we, we get to come in and be a part of breaking that cycle, um, which is pretty amazing. It's really incredible. Yeah. One more? So you'd still have to go through the training because it's yeah. confidential information. Um, and so, but if you wanted to go through the training, you don't have to, we have some advocates that just want to see the child once a month, they don't want to do all the other stuff, so their volunteer supervisor does the, um, does the paperwork stuff and kind of makes the phone calls and the records requests or anything like that, and they are the, just the contact of the child and do that check-in once a month. Um, and then we also, especially in the summertime, have lots of plan, um, tabling events. And so sitting at those and, and interacting with the community in that way, um, or fundraising for Give More 24, but you have to go through that training because there's so much confidential information um, in the program. So. One more. Do we have training for foster parents now? Oh yes, yeah. so that's through the department and through and Core Health and a couple other places. But they they have lots and lots of trainings yeah. for. Right, right. I think they've gotten better about it. <laughs> I still have some some complaints, but <laughs> but they have gotten the support really. That's what was needed was support for those families to these really difficult things they were dealing with. So the support's gotten a lot better, I think. Thank you so much. Okay, so here's a couple mugs for you. Oh, thank you. And an application. <laughs> one for your husband. <laughs> yeah. Greg said he already gave you one, so. <laughs> All right, so moving on. Uh, Margie, do we have any guests today? Did Kirby sign in? He just walked in. I seen him walk in. It's just okay. So, do you have anything for Sunshine March? Okay. So, getting on to announcements here. Let's see. Paul Spears.
and we, we need people to look for places that we can move all that uh, screen of dream stuff to and our uh, cooling wagon and ice cream wagon. So, and I know a lot of you know a lot of hot novels around town, so you can go and ask them if they got a free spot or something that we could move this all of our stuff to. We've got till the end of the month. So, yeah. They gave us uh, till the end of October. So, anyway, thank you. You know, we, we need help with this um, project, so it is a, a, a club problem, not just individual people problem. Thank you. Tom, President Tom. Yep. So if we break this up into bite-sized chunks, you might be able to see that there's a different kind of solution. When we talked about this last week, we are thinking it's about 2,000 square feet we needed. But if you had 500 square feet, we could put the ice cream wagon there. If somebody else has a couple of hundred square feet, we could put some stuff there. We have to solve the problem, not, not be a perfect solution, okay? So it's just kind of like be there. If somebody knows somebody that's got an empty garage. It's true. I don't know him because my brother's garage, you couldn't put a can of chili in there. That's a whole other story. Sorry, President Bob. Yeah. Okay, uh, Greg? Oh, he's up. President Tom Phil Lyons, guests, a uh, couple of announcements. Uh, the first one is membership. Uh, there's no, uh, it, it's installment or installation fee to uh, Lions Clubs International, so that's a good deal there. Uh, in November, I'm planning a uh, uh, membership drive. This can be very, very easy. Uh, more information to come. The other announcement, the uh, phone in our building has been fixed by the uh, phone company. So if you're in the shop and you see the light blinking and there's a message on it, take the message and if it's for sight and hearing, get all the information done accurately and just give me a call and I'll take care of it. With sight and hearing uh, in mind, our sight and hearing foundation meeting is tomorrow night at 6.30, Canterbury Park. Anybody is in the club is more than welcome to join us, find out how we operate and uh, it's kind of an eye-opener. For those that have been there, they know. So please, show up, see what we do. Time, time, Greg. What time? 6.30. Thank you. Um, Ray, did you have? No, Louis covered it. Tom, oh, thank you. How about that? I can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Oh, um, I've just been advised, Tom, President Tom, fellow Alliance, and our guest, um, Louis signaling, don't talk. So, no, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> so, okay. so, I got a question. Yes. My Greg, if the message is about my new car warranty expiring, should I get that information to you also? No, call Steve Holtz. Call Steve Holtz, there we go. All right. All right, so moving along, Cindy. President Tom, members and guests, we have a few visitations, if you'd like. Um, first of all, I'm going to announce the uh, MD-19 Fall Convention. It will be November 5th and 6th, and it's going to be virtual, so everybody can go. And we'll get credit for it for being the visitation. So that's, um, and I'll send out the flyer, so look for it. If you're not getting my emails, I've been sending a lot out, so you might want to call me and see if I have your email right. I have the mind under spam. <laughs> you can open it first. <laughs> anyway, here's a sign up if you're going to be attending so that I know and give you credit. 
give us credit. Um, White Cane is having a safety awareness day, October 15th. It's also a Zoom. Information's on here. I'll send it out also. So on that site and hearing, they have information of what White Cane is about, and they have the history of how it got started. So I thought it was kind of interesting. And then next spring is our District Governor Maryland's convention, and it's going to be at the Heathman in Vancouver. So I know it's a little early for sign-up, but I just wanted to get out there so you're kind of comfortable that this is going to happen. And it'd be really nice if it's at our end of the country that we have a big showing. And then visitation. So tonight, you can go to Pennsylvania. All right. <laughs> it's Halloween month. <laughs> So that's tonight at 6.30. The address is here. You can take a picture of it. It's also in your newsletter. It is um, an hour and 36 minutes. I even recorded how much time it took to get somewhere. <coughs> Only for my benefit so I can squeeze a couple in. And then uh, Skamakwe. That's not me. Canadian Lions, Thursday, October 14th at noon. They're going to have a meeting at the Big T's restaurant. For me, that's an opportunity to go to another restaurant. So I'm going to go to that. Well, we are going to that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, we're going to, at 7 o'clock, we're going to go to the Zone 4th meeting. And that is in Winlock. So it's only 35 minutes. It'll be a traveling day. He's not much of a traveler, but we're going to make it happen. And then um, Thursday, the center is having a meeting, October 21st, and Aberdeen is going to have a Zoom meeting. So those who don't want to get out the freeway, there's opportunities for you to. Thank you. Okay, uh, Marilyn? <laughs> President Tom, fellow Lions and guests, I just wanted to bring attention to our speaker for next week. It is uh, the district's second vice district governor who is serving also as my environmental chair. And he's also participating with MD19. All said and done, he wants to come and share composting. And I wanted to encourage you to invite anybody that you know that loves to garden and fertilize with natural organics food, composting style. I'm pretty sure that's what he's going to share. So, What's so funny about that? I thought he's laughing. Right? Bring your own bin. Yeah, we'll have a workshop. I don't know. I just wanted you to welcome him next week. Hey, Marilyn. Marilyn, did, did you send me a message at that meeting tonight? Is that 6 instead of 6.30? Okay. Okay, but it is 6, not 6.30. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gina. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on here. I asked Vero if she would please put her sign-up sheet of if you have more interest in that class and would like to speak with somebody involved with the program. It's right there on the slide-up sheet table at the very end. So if you're more interested in learning more about it, please put your name down. Okay. Um, Louis, did you have something else to bring up? <laughs> <laughs> Is there something at the shop that you wanted to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, well, that's, I put that at the top of the agenda, so it's okay. Why don't you bring it next Tuesday for the composting guy? <laughs> don't, do we have some hamburger and, no, oh, you took care of it, thank you. Hold on. Okay, uh, moving on. Cindy, do we have any uh, senility today, or do you get a chance? Are we going to do happy bucks, or can we just sit down? What are we doing here? Can 
got, you, you'll get the, your happy bucks. Somebody, I mean, it's like every week, and I keep meaning to say something, but is Josh here? No. Claypool? No. no. He keeps getting marked as being here. John does it. John does it. <laughs> Age has that thing on us, you know. We, we look at the last name, not the first. <laughs> we can remember only one. He signs everything that says Claypool. So, okay, so moving along. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Palmer and Isla. I'm sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, I would like everybody to make sure to give a round of applause to our own Mike, who is a world champion. I just want to say I've missed you these past three weeks and I'm very happy to be back. Thank you. Here I come. Marilyn Patterson, District Governor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> President Tom Fellow Lanza, yeah. 
Yes, I have one dollar, and I want to know if you want to hear about a bad experience with a toilet, or just the fact that, no, it's not that bad. We got up at four this morning, and are been on the road, and we're heading for, what's that place, Pennsylvania? Yeah. <laughs> Long Beach tonight. What do you want to hear? I could come up with another buck if you have to. Well, let's hear about Dr. Oz. About the toilet. <laughs> it was a Sunday night, and our son, who was probably two or three, thought that an apple or a stick would be good to put down the toilet. <laughs> the bad part of the story is that Steve was hammering. I'm so bad to laugh trying to get the bolts loose or something to take the toilet apart so we could get that out. It came apart, it cracked. <laughs> a family of five didn't have a toilet on a Sunday night. We hunted for every store we could possibly find that was open. We find it, found Ernst Hardware or who? Pay and pack and found what we needed. So in the meantime, we called the neighbors and said, can we borrow your toilet? <laughs> Thank you, we just eat them for dinner that they really needed it. John Claypool. Yeah. Last, last time I checked, that was my name. Uh, <laughs> President Tom, fellow Lions and guest. Uh, in the interest of enjoying the small things in life, I, I've been watching a little baseball, and I was blessed with getting to watch uh, Tampa Bay Ray player Randy Abracadabra, I really can't pronounce his last name, <laughs> steal home the other night over the weekend. You think, uh, you think a no-hitter is great? Watch a guy steal home base. It was wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, that would hit the reels. That was pretty cool to watch. Sorry. We're in the chronically depressed neighborhood over here. Hey, how about Ken? Reds and Tom, fellow lines of guests, I got a happy dollar and a thank you for Mr. Tom Fulton. You presented a terrific meeting today and let our speakers have the time to talk. Thank you. Oh. Says the guy who asked 13 questions because he didn't listen to any of the day. Yes. <laughs> 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 no, he listened. It's just that he's got this retention problem, <laughs> not water. <laughs> <laughs> I've got uh, King Lion and Tom. I've got uh, a happy dollar for me and a sad dollar for my wife. The happy dollar for me is I'm almost up walking around. Uh, and uh, to add to that, I made contact with an old past district governor today, Lyle Williams, who is now 90, celebrating his 92nd birthday, and he didn't look a damn day over 90. <laughs> My wife's unhappy dollar is because she couldn't be here today because she had to put up with me all day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's day drinking. Now we understand. Yeah. Why and how? Hey, President Tom Fell, Lance, a guest. I have a question for the group. Ken, I want you to listen to this answer, okay? How many people are they handling? 220. 220. We're only heard it four times, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, but how many are in there? Right. And, and the 40, that's right. Second hat, happy dollar, is um, my brother's standing, because I heard yesterday he wasn't standing so much. So, get better. Way to go. Hey, thanks. Hey, you betcha. Oh, we got some up here? We'll come back around today. We'll come back around today. Yeah, we closed out with Dave. Yes. Doing good. Well, you know, President Tom Bell lines, and yes, I always have my happy five bucks. Why in hell does it allude to something? Um, it's really dumb how your body plays tricks on you. You know? Oh, that was 
some days you wake up and you feel like a million bucks, and the next day you feel like the IRS just sent your fifth letter, you know? <laughs> That's how I've been feeling the last few days, but a little bit better today. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, I do have some other uh, happier, gooder news. Uh, gooder news. Yeah, I have a little bit gooder news. Uh, I was really happy that I didn't have to golf in the month of September so that, you know, I wouldn't be completely out of golf balls, but I really am looking forward to a November uh, with uh, my two sons. We're supposed to go golfing in November. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's going to be a weird kind of thing. We're warm Pretty clothing warm. in Arizona. Yeah. 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 He didn't, he didn't yeah, say it was in Arizona. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, everybody else all good? Is that a number of golf rounds? Yeah. <laughs> all right, run away, Dave. Here we go. Here's that four happy bucks. Four dollars. I think I'm going to sit here. Uh,
No, sight and hearing. Sight and hearing, okay. And then over here at the table, all the sign-ups, don't be afraid. And then, Gina, are you having a meeting right after? Okay. And Gina's having an awards meeting. All right, let's move on with the tickets here. Uh, white ticket number. 473 538. Oh, Mr. Palmer got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so while they're doing that, uh, the red ticket, 390-859. Harold, white cane, queen of spades. Okay, and now it's up to Darlene.